Well, hello, everybody. I'm John O'Loughlin. Welcome to McDuff Lives. Glad to have you with me as we continue our readings from The Sleeper Agent by A.W. Finnegan. Sleeper Agent, The Rise of Lyme Disease, Chronic Illness, and the Great Imitator Antigens of Biological Warfare. With an introduction by John Loftus, the former Nazi hunter of the Justice Department, uh, who has written a number of very important and helpful books, beginning in 1982 with the Belarus Secret. And that book is discussed somewhat in our next part of this reading. So, Mr. Loftus, I look forward to talking to you. I'm going to uh, make an effort to get in touch and possibly interview you for the show after I have absorbed some more of this amazing book uh, to which you absolutely have contributed a great deal. And, uh, you know, our author, uh, Adam Finnegan, uh, you know, he, he credits uh, John Loftus for a great bit of his uh, primary research, but it's obviously uh, Adam Finnegan's specialty to get into the biology and into the incredible uh, uh, details of what he has identified as a strategic bio warfare attack against the United States. Well, we were talking about the uh, LCM virus and how it was possible to transmit that. Uh, it, through various manipulations to become uh, an agent of human infection and, in particular, Lyme disease. So let's uh, let's just repeat the last paragraph. At any rate, the Borrelia genus of genus of spirochetes. Spirochetes are little animals that have spiral forms to which the agent of Lyme disease belongs, sheds a bewildering, ar bewildering array of these immune-damaging lipids in small particles called blebs. So in some ways, there would be no need for genetically altering the Borrelia anserina spirochete any further if it could already infect humans. Hard-body ticks and all the animals responsible for its spread. Since it did not, the use of animal viruses to adapt the spirochete to a broad range of new hosts and hard-bodied ticks that feed on humans would guarantee its promotion in the environment. Over many decades, there would be a snowball effect where the agent is thriving exponentially more with each passing decade, making some think it was a factor of climate change rather than nefarious bio-warfare activities. Additionally, since Traub was putting a virtual cocktail of disease in these ticks, he would not only need to adapt the spirochete to these new ticks and new animal hosts to become reservoirs of disease, but likewise the tick-borne co-infections like rickettsia, protozoal blood parasites, Babesia, avian malaria, Bartonella, Leptospira, and other any other co-infection would be helpful in creating an environment in which the cocktail of pathogens are able to act in synergy and overwhelm the host together while benefiting each other. Evidence suggests these tick-borne co-infections came from diverse animals such as horses, dogs, and cattle. Therefore, he would also have to adapt these agents to birds so they could be carried and spread by the birds, and thus a virus like Newcastle disease virus or avian influenza could be used to adapt a pathogen only affecting cattle to a new host in birds. The possibilities were endless. If Traub wanted to use ticks that feed on humans, he would need to adapt the cocktail of disease agents to the other animals and birds that it feeds on. Certain animal viruses could be used with ease for this process, and it became easier when multiple disease agents were used simultaneously 
because they tended to act synergistically in each other's benefit once the host's immune system defenses were overwhelmed by the mix of infections. Most of the pathogens Traub worked on had nasty lipid components that suppressed and evaded the immune system, while some, like Bartonella, had very toxic proteins called endotoxin that made the host feel horrible. But yet, ironically, the damaged immune system allowed for minimal antibodies and very little visible signs of disease as it integrated into the lymph nodes, brain, and central nervous system. Even routine blood work would not reveal the multiple disease agents overwhelming the host. Traub later published about this lack of abnormal blood work and absence of antibodies in mice chronically infected with LCM virus in 1960. It can be said with confidence that Traub's weaponized ticks and tick-borne disease had several developments, resulting in several circulating strains. When Russia took Inzel Reims, they took strains with them. European strains of the Lyme disease agent were already spreading in Germany and Eastern Europe before he came to American shores and produced the American strains. Furthermore, Donald McLean and British intelligence would have been given cultures from what Traub took with him in 1945 when applying for work in the West, as well as in 1948 when he made his escape. Donald McLean is said to have been directing Plum Island tests just after World War II up to 1948 when he left for Cairo, Egypt, and was vacationing on Long Island, New York, just south of Plum Island during his work in America. Therefore, the presence of the Lyme disease agent just after 1945 or before Traub's return to American shores would still be in line with this story that British intelligence took strains from him early on when World War II just ended and Traub continued developing and spreading it when he returned to American shores for full-time work. Other researchers have also suggested tick-infested hides that were sent to American ports just after World War II, and since they took his strains to Russia when they captured in Reims, this would also still be in line with the story. It served as the large-scale biological terrorism against the West by Stalin and the communists, the day X described by former KGB agent turned defector Alexander Kuzminov. Attempts to disprove the biological warfare connection by academic researchers like Sam Telford and David H. Persing will be covered in later chapters. Wow, so just a a quick comment here. What we've got in this one or two paragraphs is the accusation that British intelligence has been facilitating the Soviet intelligence sabotage of the American environment and health system and and blood and sabotaging our our human our humanity, our biology through a stealthy strategic program of increasingly virulent and increasingly uh, pathogenic animal diseases that are somehow transformed through multiple, multiple passages that are just so hard to imagine as to make it hardly hard to believe. But nevertheless, our story tells us that that's what Eric Traub did. And that connection of the British intelligence with the Soviet biological warfare effort and its deployment in the United States, well, that's a smoking gun against the British and a 
exposition and an expose of the of the of the treasonous or traitorous activity of people both the British themselves and people in this country that knowingly facilitated what's gone on. Day X, the attack on America by Joseph Stalin in the 1950s and its facilitation and then the cover-up, which we'll read about in subsequent chapters. This is why I can't stop reading this book. It is, and, and it rings true to me. It just rings true. Uh, I don't know what that's worth, except for that's the way I feel about it. Well, let's keep going. It's breathtaking. I'm sorry. It's just a, an, an amazing thing to sit here and read this book and feel that the Lyme disease disaster and other disasters that we haven't even uncovered yet have been planted in our biology. It's, it's stunning. In regard to Willy Bergdorfer, he was not the man responsible for weaponizing Lyme spirochetes, as he did not have the skill and understanding of animal disease and their hosts, like Traub and his technical assistants had. In fact, it is clear that Bergdorfer did not know what he was dealing with initially, since he accidentally infected himself in the laboratory early on in his work with the agent. As we have covered previously, Anna Berger's approval, that is her approval of the contract to come here, although she didn't actually come, stated that there were no scientists in America with the level of skill that Traub and Berger held. Moreover, we will, see, we will later see how an important poultry conference discussing avian spiroketosis and bioterrorism against the United States in 1953 already took place before Bergdorfer was able to sign on to biodefense work in 1954. It is possible that he could have taken part in later simulant testing that spread Traub's weaponized ticks, but he, would probably, he was probably an unwitting participant. Furthermore, Bergdorfer would be the last person chosen to publicly discover the agent if he had been involved in the blunder. The weapon in essence, was the lipid portion found in the outer surface proteins of certain pathogens and viruses that stimulated the respective immune system receptors responsible for throwing the immune system into disarray. Traub did not create them per se, but he stumbled upon their effects in LCM virus and manipulated what nature provided to make very effective weapons for crippling populations with incapacitating strategic bioweapons. The spirochetes would deliver the toxic surface proteins, which then would awaken the many sleeping viruses within us, causing complex chronic neurodegenerative diseases, while equally promoting psychiatric disorders, mental health problems, and cancers just like Traub had done to his little mice back at the Rockefeller Institute in 1935. And that is the conclusion of The Serpent Strikes, Chapter 9. And now we'll move on after a short break to chapter 10, A Sleeper in the Ranks, The Loyalties of Eric Traub and His Mission in America.
What destroys us most effectively is not a malign fate, but our own capacity for self-deception and for degrading our own best self. A quote from George Eliot. When Eric Traub began his work for the U.S. military in 1949, it was at a time when concentrated efforts at biological warfare program were in full swing. The Cold War was well underway, and by the following year, the tripartite cooperation between the United States, Britain, and Canada saw an expansion and the establishment of the North American Treaty Organization, NATO, and the United Nations, the UN, had been created in 1945. Cooperation between the Western countries had its benefits, but certainly came with risks, especially when it came to espionage. On the global battlefield, proxy wars would continue to be fought through armed conflict up to the present time, but direct wars between global superpowers would change dramatically. Newer, unconventional weapons and ways of fighting wars were rapidly developing. Nuclear weapons were becoming far too risky and destructive to use in wars. Therefore, alternatives like chemical and biological warfare were seen as more acceptable solution. As demonstrated in the previous chapter, Traub was instrumental in the biological weapons program of tripartite countries, especially the American program. Despite his status as a veterinarian, he was the most skilled bioweaponeer available to the Americans, and his position could not be matched by any other person in the military or academic circles within the United States. He was very high up in the American program and supervised many of the germ warfare tests on Plum Island, at Fort Detrick, and other sites. In 1950, the Korean War began, and the United Nations and American military attempted to defend off the North Koreans from invading South Korea. However, the war was a complete disaster for the West, as the communists fighting in the Korean War were obliterating the strategy of American and UN forces in South Korea by the North. According to John Loftus, a decision was made to employ Traub's weaponized germs and insects as a last-ditch effort to sway the war in their favor. Big mistake. Somehow, the Chinese and North Koreans were prepared for the attack and intercepted the tick and insect bombs as they were dropped from the planes, while several American planes were shot down and their pilots taken prisoner. While they were not able to stop the diseases from spreading in the decades to come, they had numerous countermeasures and spotted the planes as they were being deployed to minimize the effect and spread of these insects and germs. John Loftus says of the Korean War, quote, Traub and McLean helped design the insect bombs that the Americans and British military had just dropped on North Korea and China. This was a clear violation of the international treaty prohibiting the development or use of biological weapons. This violation allowed the Russians to blackmail several key members of the Eisenhower administration into silence. According to declassified CIA intelligence reports, the Soviet Union su supplied the North Koreans and Chinese with various medical prophylactics like Sira and vaccines, but with the vaccines, this was followed by nasty reactions. According to a Soviet analysis of biological warfare and its response in Korea, it was noted that many agents cannot be immunized against because they fail to have any effect. According to other researchers, who, what prevented these large epidemics was a combination of insecticides, prophylactics, and medical prevention teams deployed to intercept the bug bombs dropped on Chinese and Korean soil. It would appear that someone within the ranks had indeed been tipping them off before the bug bombs were dropped. This was no surprise since Donald McLean had suddenly disappeared from the ranks of British intelligence in 1951. After an intensive search and investigation, a recording was found of McLean voicing his allegiance to the Soviet Union, declaring that not only was he a communist, he was a proselytizing communist. 
McLean had been a key component in the facilitation of tripartite agreements between the United States, Britain, and Canada, and was instrumental in clearing many of the paperclip scientists for work in America. Not to mention, he had been assisting Traub's escape from East Germany and testing activities on American shores. McLean had been stationed in Cairo, Egypt since 1948 and had intelligence on the African tick and insect expeditions by the Navy's NAMRU-3 program that was initiated that year, mining disease agents and insects all over the African continent. According to John Loftus, McLean was the one responsible for getting Traub back into the United States after the war, and McLean directed joint British testing at Plum Island and other testing sites since World War II. Plum Island was conducting biological warfare tests in 1944 with brucellosis, and McLean was stationed in Washington from 1944 to 47, taking vacations on Long Island, New York. Did I just say Long Island? I'm sorry. On Long Island, New York, right in the vicinity of Plum Island in the Long Island Sound. McLean would have had access to cultures of weaponized spirochetes from Traub through British intelligence sources just after 1945 when Traub was in the British and American zone applying for work with the West, and Traub brought cultures with him in 1948 when he made his official escape. By 1952, Traub was officially offered the lead scientist position on Plum Island by Dr. Maurice Shahan, S-H-A-H-A-N, the first director of Plum Island, but Traub declined. Why was that so? Extensive background checks might be one such reason. Pardon me. Traub's Interrogation by CIC Agent Dan Benjamin Just after World War II, the revelations of Igor Gozenko exposed massive spy rings operating in Britain, Canada, and the United States. As a result, this eventually led to the discovery of Traub's handler, the one who helped him get cleared for Operation Paperclip, Donald McLean of MI6, one of the key people who helped set up NATO defecting to Russia in 1951. When you think about that, I mean, I'm sorry, I just have to make another comment. That this guy was one of the key people that put together NATO, and then he goes to Russia. And all the time he's been in the Cambridge Five with MI6, you know, and we talk about five eyes today, you know, it, it seems to me it's all been, all been uh, uh, one big happy family for a long, long time. And the British intelligence service is right in the core of it. John Loftus said it was around this time Traub began to get nervous, turning down top positions at the USDA's Plum Island, and this aroused the suspicion of military intelligence. Traub's release of large amounts of weaponized insects, such as ticks, mosquitoes, and mites, were carrying much more than harmless benign tracers, and soon Traub's assistance in the States would be a cornered rat. Author Linda Hunt was the first to bring forth the military's employment of Eric Traub and Operation Paperclip. John Loftus exposed the Lyme disease connection to biological warfare in the Belarus secret. And a footnote tells us, republished as America's Nazi secret by Trine Day in 2010. In 2004, author Michael Christopher Carroll likewise brought more attention to Eric Traub and the activities around Plum Island in Lab 257, the disturbing story of the government's secret Plum Island germ laboratory. 
Now, for the first time in this book, John Loftus further tells the story of Traub's interrogation by counterintelligence corps agent Dan Benjamin to bring forth these startling new revelations of Eric Traub's confession to being a Soviet double agent of the KGB. And now this is a quote from John Loftus. Author Linda Hunt never got the credit she deserved for exposing Nazi scientists who had entered America under Operation Paperclip. Linda Hunt had been the first American journalist to visit Enzel Reims, the secret island off the northern coast of Germany. This was where, from 1945 onwards, Nazi scientist Dr. Eric Traub and Stalin's biological warfare experts continued their joint research on immunological weapons. Linda Hunt is the giant upon whose shoulders all future biowarfare researchers have stood. Several authors ripped off her research into the declassified intelligence files and then published her archival discoveries without citation under their own names. But I know the truth. Ms. Hunt was first to warn the world about the dangers of the paperclip scientists, but she was not the first one to warn me about the evil Dr. Traub. That credit belongs to Dan and Anne Benjamin, arguably the best husband-wife intelligence team before Bob Baer of CIA married a woman smarter than he was. No, I don't know that reference. Sorry. After World War II, Dan was an agent in the U.S. Army's elite counterintelligence corps, the CIC. Dan became the senior CIC agent in charge of anti-communist intelligence for the American zone of occupied Germany, a position he later held for the entire European command, UCOM G2, and then finally at the Pentagon, where he was a Department of Army civilian who liaised with the CIA. The Pentagon thought that Dan's charming British wife, Anne, was just a secretary. In fact, Anne did start as a secretary for the government in the British zone of occupied Germany. But like her husband, her brilliance was soon recognized. What Dan's friends in the Pentagon never knew was that Anne was recruited as an officer in the British Secret Intelligence Service, SIS or MI6. It was Anne who was in charge of the British secret intelligence archives for occupied Germany. Anne received reports from Frederick van den Heuvel. Freddie was the SIS officer in charge of recruiting Nazi scientists, many of whom were British government protected from prosecution as war criminals. Freddie's best recruiting agent was, you're going to love this, Robert Maxwell who ran a German, quote, publishing house, unquote, for scientific papers. Well, publication was a bait no scientist could refuse. Maxwell's publishing company for scientific papers was an SIS front to lure Nazi scientists to come out of hiding before the Russians could find them and drag them off to Moscow. By 1949, as the SIS archivist in post-war Germany, Anne Benjamin had probably learned all that could be learned about SIS recruitment of Nazi scientists, including the evil Nazi genius Dr. Traub. According to the SIS reports Anne received, the Russians had held Dr. Traub in custody in com communist-controlled Eastern Europe after World War II, but SIS somehow arranged Traub's miraculous, quote, escape, unquote, to West Germany. Anne and her American husband, Dan Benjamin, were suspicious. By 1951, it was clear to them that the senior SIS officers who approved Dr. Traub's escape from the Soviet Army's clutches were none other than Kim Philby and Donald McLean, the highest ranking communist spies inside British intelligence. Dan and Anne suspected, parentheses correctly, that it was the same Cambridge ring of communist spies inside the SIS that had arranged Dr. Traub's immigration to America under Operation Paperclip. Kim Philby's underling and, quote, and lover, Donald McLean, was the SIS's scientific liaison to the Americans, advising them which Nazis were worth recruiting. 
it should be no surprise that the American space program was, quote, advised, unquote, by McLean to recruit useless Nazi bureaucrats like Werner von Braun, while the Russians recruited the real rocket experts of the Third Reich. That is why the Russians were the first to succeed in launching their Sputnik satellite into orbit while American missiles kept exploding on the launch pad. As Khrushchev boasted to Nixon that, quote, our Germans are better than your Germans, unquote. As the Benjamins had feared, several of the Nazi, Nazi rocket scientists recruited under Operation Paperclip turned out to have been war criminals like Arthur Rudolph, whom, which made him subject to Soviet blackmail. After U.S. intelligence officials publicly admitted to expunging the records of Nazi scientists, Arthur Rudolph agreed to surrender his American citizenship and be deported. Another famous Nazi scientist was Ohio State University's Albertus Strugholt. After he was exposed as a war criminal, the university took the professor's name off of one of their buildings. That is only the tip of Ohio State's iceberg. There are eight underground levels nearby in Columbus, Ohio, built by the U.S. military, to which the students are not allowed. That is amazing, isn't it? This is still John Loftus, a long quote, so we're continuing reading from his text. No one in the Pentagon suspected at the time that Dr. Traub was perhaps the most villainous of all the Nazis to enter America. He was just a German veterinarian with some exper expertise in animal vaccines, a very profitable market for American pharmaceutical companies. The greed of Big Pharma to employ Nazi scientific experts like Traub led to the Benjamins' warnings being ignored. But soon, the American military began to realize that Dan Benjamin may have been right to suspect that there was more to his story. Dr. Traub had been recruited by Donald McLean and the Cambridge, of the Cambridge Five spy ring inside SIS. McLean, the communist agent, had advised the gullible Americans which German scientists should be brought to America under Operation Paperclip. When McLean defected to Moscow in 1951, the Pentagon realized that Dan Benjamin was the only one who had been asking the right questions about the Nazi scientists whom McLean had sent to America, especially Dr. Traub. Dan Benjamin was asked by the Department of Defense to investigate why Dr. Traub had refused three times to accept a promotion for director of the biological laboratory on Plum Island between Connecticut and New York's Long Island. Was it because the Plum Island job required an intensive investigation for a top secret clearance? Was there something in Dr. Traub's past that he feared would be discovered? Dan Benjamin personally interrogated Dr. Traub. As the CIA will attest, Dan was probably the best interrogator in American intelligence. He never used torture or truth serums. Dan simply studied everything about his subject before he ever met him. Dan was friendly to Dr. Traub, but made it clear to him that the actual interview was an unnecessary formality. Dan already knew Traub's miraculous escape, quote-unquote, from communist East Germany had been arranged with the help of the communist spy ring inside the British SIS. Dan briefly walked Traub through a few of the many contradictions and cover-ups in Traub's record. Did Dr. Traub have anything he wished to say for the record before he was handed over for sentencing as a spy for the KGB? The bluff seemed to work. Dr. Traub decided to confess. He admitted that he had been captured by the Russian army at the end of World War II. He admitted that his fake escape from East Germany was arranged by Philby and McLean because he promised to serve the Soviet Union as a communist spy inside American intelligence. But Traub claimed he was such an unimportant little guy that the Russians never activated him for espionage. In fact, they never even bothered him again. Traub's explanation was that the Soviet intelligence must have had so many other high-level spies among the Nazi paperclip scientists that the KGB never needed to contact a low-level veterinarian like him. Traub said he repeatedly refused American promotions, requiring any security clearance because he wanted to keep a low profile so the Russians would not bother 
with a little guy like him. It was a lie, but it was one that the Eisenhower administration desperately wanted to hear. Traub's public trial could have exposed the Dulles brothers' perfidious behavior. Whoa. Oh, my goodness. The Dulles brothers' perfidious behavior. <laughs> I'll be right back. Instead of following Dan's recommendation to prosecute Dr. Traub as a communist spy and investigate all the other German scientists, the Eisenhower administration ordered the Pentagon to accept Traub's rather dubious explanation. Nevertheless, the army insisted that if Traub was not going to be sent to prison, at the very least, Traub should be fired from all his American contracts and deported back to Germany where he should be placed under continuous surveillance and banned from any classified research. Instead, the Eisenhower administration allowed Traub to continue serving as a UN health inspector. The UN status plausibly, and I love that word plausibly, right, afforded Traub diplomatic immunity from American arrest as a confessed communist spy. To my shame, and this is Loftus again, I did not give Dan's story about this seemingly minor Nazi scientist much priority for a follow-up. Even though my time and funds were limited by my health, I did not give up entirely. In the late 1980s, I asked Rachel Verdon, V-E-R-D-O-N, one of my wonderful Lyme disease volunteers, to request declassification of government records concerning Plum Island. Rachel discovered that nearly all the records were still classified or had been destroyed, including the bioweapons master file named, quote, clandestine attacks on, crop, on crops and animals, unquote, which had been illegally shredded. Rachel also discovered many open source documents confirming my source's insistence that the Russians had extensively studied tick-borne disease for more than a half a century. Rachel's tireless research was not wasted as it did prove beyond any doubt that the U.S. government had built a brick wall of secrecy around whatever the communist double agents had done at Plum Island. I did cooperate openly with another author in a wonderful book called Lab 257, but there was not much that I could tell him while the classification order was still in effect. Even if Dan Benjamin had mentioned Traub's name, I had quite forgotten it for many years, until I was accidentally reminded by Hollywood producers looking into Traub's background with tick experiments at Plum Island. How many German scientists under Operation Paperclip could there be who repeatedly declined promotions to be director of research at Plum Island? Traub had to be the same man who confessed to Dan that he was a spy for the KGB. Dan and Anne had passed away before I could tell them that I had figured out why Traub never went to prison as a Nazi war criminal turned KGB spy. Traub was untouchable because he could blackmail the Eisenhower administration. It was Traub who designed the insect bombs that the U.S. Air Force had dropped on North Korea and China. It was not his first such war crime. Unquote. And uh, as we, we did not read the entire preface, um, so perhaps you are not aware that uh, John Loftus also uh, suffers from Lyme disease. You know, one, uh, while I'm catching my breath, just a thought I want to make sure and, and register here, and that is that as I am reading it, the the narrative includes the Cambridge spy ring being a nest of communists nested within MI6 or the SIS, but not necessarily 
agents of the NI, of the SIS or the British government or anybody else, just a, a spy ring that happens to be nested inside the British spy system. And I just don't look at it that way. I'm Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that it's possible for that so-called com communist Cambridge Five spy ring to have existed inside of the heart of British intelligence without it being in some way approved of. I could be wrong, but I just don't believe it. So... There's one difference I have with the narrative here, because how could, how could it be, honestly? Well, you know what? I don't know. I'm going to look forward to trying to uh, answer that question as I interview uh, Adam again tomorrow night at 11, I mean, at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, Adam Finnegan has agreed to join me for a fourth live interview, and that will be tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern time. All right, let's wrap up this chapter, and it's the sleeper in the ranks. The Aftermath, a cover-up and back to Germany. By 1952, the U.S. military and Western intelligence had a real problem on their hands. Worse, a complete embarrassment. What normally would have meant a death sentence for a confessed Soviet double agent was covered up and classified at the highest levels, most likely due to the fact that he had a lot of dirt on the biological testing activities during his time on the biological warfare program and the biological weapons used in the Korean War. To top it off, he also could have had dirt on the Rockefeller Institute. <laughs> no kidding. Clearly, Traub could bring others right down with him if a public trial were to follow. This was already a nightmare situation, but they did not want the additional public scandal to follow. Bad enough that they took a Nazi bioweaponeer who was in all property, probability a war criminal, employed him to work on the most sensitive areas of the biological weapons program, already a dirty business to be in, but worse, Traub was also a Soviet double agent. How damaging this would be if it ever got out. Furthermore, he already had diplomatic immunity due to his being an official of the Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO, of the UN. As the story goes, they sent him back to Bogota, Colombia, until they could figure out what next to do with him. Throughout Eric Traub's second tenure in the United States, the FBI conducted ongoing investigations into his loyalties and associations, interviewing some of his associates, such as William A. Hagen, Frank A. Todd, James D. Horton, former Rockefeller colleagues like Carl Tenbrook, Richard E. Shope, Ernest Smilly, Ralph B. Little, John B. Nelson, as well as colleagues from the Naval Institute, such as Wallace P. Rowe, Herbert Hurlbert, Hurlbut, Worth I. Capps, and even former Reich scientist Theodore Bensinger a high-altitude and decompression researcher who had at one time been on the defendant's list to be tried for war crimes at Nuremberg. The reactions were mixed, either having a strong dislike of Dr. Traub, indifference, or friendly to great admiration of him. Some of the more notable responses were made by former colleagues at Rockefeller Institute, such as Carl Tenbrook, Ralph P. Little, and John Nelson. According to his former professor, Dr. Tenbrook, Traub was a very hard worker, but described him as cocksure and arrogant. He admitted that Dr. Traub never discussed politics nor expressed any opinion for or against Hitler. But he did mention that Blanca was never happy in the U.S. and always felt she had to defend herself and her homeland. Dr. Ernest Ernest Smilly, that's S M I L L I E. Superintendent of the Prince Princeton, New Jersey section of the Rockefeller Institute, on the other hand, described him as extremely pro-Nazi in a 1942 investigation. But this is contradicted in his second interview in 1950. Dr. John B. Nelson, who ran secondary studies under Traub's supervision, 
gave some further insight on the moral character of the German virologist and claimed his dislike of Traub on, quote, the fact that Dr. Traub was a veterinarian and he went out of his way to be cruel to animals. Dr. Nelson stated that he felt that any person who is cruel to animals shows little distinction and difference in his treatment of his fellow human beings, unquote. Another former Rockefeller Institute colleague echoed what Nelson had to say, describing Traub as, quote, a domineering German and surly type of individual with a violent temper. He said that Dr. Traub showed no consideration for animals while he was working with them and not much more consideration for the people he was associated with. Traub's American counterpart, Richard E. Shope, had some commendable remarks to make about his former German colleague, Wallace P. Rowe, one of Traub's new American colleagues and virologists, recalled Traub saying that the Russians who overtook Enzel Reims, quote, stole his research results and claimed them as their own. By the time of these reports, the truth about Traub's loyalties and directed bioterrorism against the Americans and Western countries probably had not been known by more than a handful of people. It does not appear that the agents used were immediately known, but they began to infect the civilians with, a, with strange mystery diseases that were complex, hard to diagnose, and even harder to treat. These weapons began to establish themselves in the environment, and the momentum was sure to continue as the years carried on. Traub was in Bogota, Colombia, periodically until the end of 1952, and returned to Maryland. And soon decisions were made for Traub to return to Germany on October 7th, 1952, to lead a virus research institute in Tübingen, West Germany. Therefore, Erich Traub submitted his resignation from the position within the U.S. military, but continued research for them in Tübingen. Traub set, him, set himself up at the University of Tübingen upon his return, which became the cover story for those not in the know about Traub's real purpose for leaving America. Outsiders would be told that the scientists just decided to pack up and go home. Traub's repatriation was approved, and on January 14, 1953, Traub and his family boarded the SS Stockholm and sailed back to Germany, where he began his position at the University of Tübingen's Federal Research Institute for Virus Disease of Animals. Agreements were also made that upon return to Germany, Traub would have to be under surveillance for the remainder of his life. This, however, did not stop Traub from continuing relations with former Inzel Reims associates, persons of interest, exchanging of germs, among other activities, nor did it keep him off American shores with further employment by the USDA all the way up until the late 50s and possibly early 60s. Okay, well, thank you very much for being with me. I hope you uh, have, uh, you know, a strong constitution for handling this stuff and to absorb it and react to it kind of slowly, but don't let it go. Don't, don't let this revelation fade away because we need to continue to awaken people to the real story, you know, Lyme disease, biological agents. And the next chapter, Vector Weapons and Simulant Attacks, the me Means and Methods of the American Biological Warfare Program. We will rejoin the book at our next reading, but before then, join us tomorrow night, Thursday, March 7th, 2024, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, for our fourth live interview with Adam Finnegan, the author of The Sleeper Agent. <laughs>